so we're looking at principal variants in Austin cities. I'm in the so to begin, um, Alzheimer's disease affects 5.7 million people in the US and the number is expected to grow in future years. Um, it is characterized by Alzheimer's plus neurofibrillary tangles, unwanted plaques, and tumor generation. And the reason we wanted to look at the area specifically is because most of the single cell data looks at genes. And so we think that by looking at the variants, we might be able to be on some important factors of the disease. Um, so our aim is to include ranking the genes by the variants, uh, quantum correlation, and then potentially looking at genotyping that they would be as well as nutritional mice. Um, so our previous work uh, is it basically um, the Rasmat data set and um, the research on the data from the Kalasan. Um, so um, so the first step of this project was doing a single cell uh, imputation um, to try to remove a lot of the technical noise because we were thinking um, that if there's a lot of technical noise in our data set, then that might uh, mess up the variant analysis. Um, so we ended up using this program called Deep Impute, uh, which uses a machine learning algorithm um, to try to guess at like uh, missing values in the expression vectors. Um, so uh, we have NRGN, which is a marker of excitatory neurons, uh, pre imputation on the left and uh, post imputation on the right. Um, and we did this uh, for all cell types, which is just an um, example of um, one, of the, uh, one of the markers. Um, so our, our first step was the variance analysis. Um, so essentially what we did is we took uh, every cell type for uh, every patient, um, and then we looked at each gene, and then we found the variance of that gene, and then divided it by the average expression uh, value uh, for that gene. And then we rank them by the difference between the Alzheimer's population and the control population to see which genes uh, were more variantly expressed uh, in the Alzheimer's population versus the control population. Um, and then uh, this is an example for microglia uh, geo term analysis. Um, and then on the right, uh, we have the rank correlation. Um, so this is just looking across um, in one patient. If we see that gene A is high, uh, is gene B also high with it? Or is there inverse correlation, or is there just not? So uh, you see kind of a heat map of that again for microglia. Um, and right, skip one. Um, and uh, so we did this also for astrocytes, uh, oligodendrites, dendrites, uh, excitatory neurons, and uh, inhibitory neurons. And uh, essentially, what you see is kind of a higher level of uh, rank correlation between our highly varied genes and excitatory neurons uh, and inhibitory neurons. And kind of less so for astrocytes, oligodendrites, um, and microglia. And then moving on, we uh, kind of wanted to do uh, Euclidean distance analysis. Um, this has been previously been characterized um, in studies of aging. Um, so basically, this is looking at the spread of a cluster. So essentially, if you look at this cluster, you can imagine a central point in there uh, being the centroid of that cluster. And then you take the Euclidean distance between every cell. Uh, to that centroid. And then, so that uh, average infinity distance is going to be less for the cluster spread on the left, it's going to be greater for the cluster spread on the right. Um, so, uh, when we do this uh, for um, uh, our, our, uh, each patient, uh, for each cell type, um, we see that uh, for astrocytes and oligodendrites, uh, and for also microglia, as we've shown here, um, you don't see very much of a change. Uh, but for excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons, um, you kind of see like a greater uh, mean transcriptional noise um, whenever you're comparing these, these two populations. Um, so we kind of went further and uh, we decided to also uh, kind of look at gender uh, while we're doing this. So uh, it's been previously characterized um, that females are enhanced uh, for a um, uh, subpopulation of excitatory neurons that are rich in Alzheimer's disease. And indeed, when we compare uh, female controls versus female, Alzheimer's disease, we see a, uh, a greater increase in transcriptional noise. Um, and then we kind of don't see that uh, for male control versus male Alzheimer's disease. And then uh, kind of under control, we look at inhibitory neurons. Um, and although you do kind of see a greater uh, level of transcriptional noise, it's, uh, it's definitely less severe than what you see in excitatory neurons. Um, and then we also tried to characterize the role of genotype. Um, this was a little confounded uh, because uh, the single cell data set only had uh, one person in our risk control population, 
um, that had a 884 allele. Um, so uh, from this, you can kind of see um, that uh, between the protection, uh, uh, people with the protection alleles, so the 883 and 882, um, who have Alzheimer's disease, there's not very much of a difference between them and the people who uh, have the risk of this. Um, okay, so basically we found that transcription variance is included in some of the um, phenotypes of uh, Alzheimer's disease, and then also there are some known biomarkers that we'll discuss on the next slide that also have variants um, that might be important as well. Um, excitatory and inhibitory neurons are also significant changes of variants, um, and then we also found that the genotype might not be important for the um, so in terms of the biological mechanism, we tried to look at um, sort of an aggregate genome study to see if we found some of the same hits with an R data set and then also tie that to biological mechanisms to put all of this into context. So we found some important drivers in terms of uh, half oxidation, um, with metabolism and neurodegeneration, and among others. And then also we found variants in AP2 disability respect to genetic Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so with that, we would like to thank um, the Hill Slab and specifically for helping us out. So we should back to some of the earlier slides. Um, for example, uh, a little more, like the first is people, for example. Um, one, one more. Uh, one more. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'd love to see this in the same uh, view map. So basically, if you could sort of build a view map plot with a combined, included and, you know, original, just to see, because right now, you know, I don't know what, what part of the left plot has been. Yeah, you kind of have to do like a transformation in your mind if you think of it, it's like a little bit, uh, yeah, maybe like a little bit of sort of don't have the reader to see exercises before them. Yeah. And so if you could sort of use a combined dimension and then sort of plot these on top of that, and then, you know, you could sort of plot only the region, only the pre-mutation, only the post-mutation, but in a combined space, I think then that would be the exercise for it. On the next one, um, so uh, basically, it seems that you're um, you're basically talking about this variance, but but the way that you described it almost sounded like we're going to ask, are these different from those? And there's two ways to use variance there. One is, of course, to use variance in one group versus the other group, or in the combined group, and that's sort of an ANOVA thing. Uh, another one is to basically say, given the variance here, are these two sets? Significantly different between them. Whereas, basically, what you know, I, 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 I think what you're using now is sort of neither one or the other. It's just that it's more of the second than the first. Um, but anyway, yeah. Okay. It's, it's, uh, we're looking at um, basically the variants and then kind of seeing if they differ. So, we're already actually pretty high by the disease looks in health to start with. Yeah. And, and then, then you're looking at are you using variants? Um, so we're seeing that like the variance for each of the genes is like greater in the Alzheimer's population versus the control population. You don't care about the mean? Um, yeah, we're trying to like uh, regress out the mean because we don't want to see like if this this gene is highly expressed in Alzheimer's disease yeah. versus lowly expressed. This become in, more variable. Period. Yeah. Got it. If you go forward to slides. Um, so no, no, the one with the dots. Okay. Um, so. Um, the way that I understood it uh, in, in your calculation, plus your spread, you're using your median distance from the centroid. But that assumes, uh, basically, if you look at the actual distribution of a generative model, that assumes basically a, a, a cone kind of distribution as opposed to a Gaussian distribution. You see what I mean? So basically, if you use a mixture model, Gaussian mixture model instead, then you have some. Geometric follow from that cluster center in sort of the generation of these points. Whereas if you just use Euclidean distance from the center, it's as if you're sampling from a cone distribution. And therefore it just falls off straight. Anyway, look into a Gaussian. I think the GR is a good idea of Gaussian, but we have sort of the main population of Sure. Yeah. Um, and then you said enriched instead of enhanced at some point. They're enriched in the female uh, location. Um, so, uh, other, other 
question for the for the point here going on in this how are you quantifying transcription of noise that access is um transcription of noise is the metric we were talking about where you take the um it's like a little more complicated than what I'm saying, but essentially it's like the Euclidean distance of all the cells, like their centroid point. Um, there's a little more like filter. Yeah, basically like you're looking at how, how far the cells are spread out. Now, um, one way of thinking about your results is that um, as genes change in their mean, different individuals progress more or less down that path. And therefore, all of the group that we think of Alzheimer's is, in fact, a more variable group than the normal group because they're walking down the disease path. And therefore, the variance will be higher just because they're walking down that path. Well, you can think of it more as like a, on a per patient level versus on the patient ah, level. So it. as they kind of progress down the... Yeah, so their down cells the, are progressing down the disease path. Yeah, you can, you can imagine that, that um, the landscape is like, for instance, for excitatory neurons, like... Yeah. Um, some of them are experiencing changes that others aren't. So it's not like local changes versus like, a, like in, in other disease, you would expect like a global upregulation of all the genes simultaneously. Like they're all turning on the same program. I think an, an additional classification to make would be those genes that change in mean versus those genes that don't change in mean. Mm -hmm. So you could basically ask for those genes that don't change in mean, do we find a change in variance? Yeah. And for those genes that do change, then ask how much is that delta of the mean correlated with the increase in the variance. Does that make sense? Yeah. Basically, I think because it's kind of cool to be able to say, and all these genes don't show a difference in the mean, but yet they show a difference in the variance. Then it becomes sort of really, oh wow, there's more noise. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, great. Switch to the next thing. <clears throat>